This is my brother, my aunt, my mother-in-law, my other brother, and my father. These are some of my family members who have lost their life with cancer. Now the sad fact is that the numbers tell us that each one of you in this audience also can generate a similar list of people around you, family, friends, colleagues who have battled cancer. I don't have to convince you that the problem of cancer is a big, big one, but I might have to convince you of my conviction that the solution involves math. So my introduction to <laughs> my introduction to cancer involved my father. He was an engineer and a pilot. He served three tours in Vietnam before retiring. He retired shortly after I was born. So what that meant for me is in his retirement, he became an antique dealer. So that meant I spent many, many moons, <laughs> many hours on the road trans traveling from antique show to antique show. We, uh, I, by the time I was in, I think, third grade, I had traveled to 48 different states. So on those long journeys, we had to do something, and one of the things we often did was play games, specifically math games. My father would teach me, well, if x plus y is five, and x times y is six, what are x and y? I was like six years old. <laughs> so uh, needless to say, that interest and enthusiasm for mathematics started early. Unfortunately, when my father was 62, when I was 20, uh, my father was diagnosed with lung cancer. Uh, I was very involved with my father's care. Um, unfortunately, he died seven months after he was diagnosed. But being involved in his care uh, meant that I was commuting back and forth from Tulane University where I was finishing my, my bachelor's degree in math and physics. So in traveling back and forth, I would spend all this time with my father in his dying months, and I would spend a lot of time with his physicians trying to figure out what the next best step was for my father. Now at the same time, I also happened to be doing research at Tulane with some lovely mathematical biologists who were doing some amazing work on sperm motility in tubes. But it is mathematics meeting biology. I don't think you can dispute that, right? So those two things brought together an opportunity for me. I said, well, my father is sitting here. I could watch him over those sad seven months, watch him die. And I watched all those decisions being made by the physician about what is the next best choice for my dad? Should we do this therapy? Should we do that therapy? Is he failing this therapy? Should we move on to another therapy? And I remember being so powerless and frustrated in the fact that I couldn't contribute to those conversations, and worst yet, I couldn't understand what the conversation was happening. It was like a man with a bubble above his head with an equation, and it just didn't add up to me. And I was a mathematician, or a burgeoning one at that. So while I was doing this research at Tulane on sperm motility in tubes, I could see that maybe there was an opportunity for me to bring math, the mathematics my father taught me, to the biology of cancer and contribute to the world that, to improve the life of my father and others like him. So yes, I'm a mathematician and I study cancer. So a month after my father was d died, um, I, I was, uh, was admitted to a PhD program in applied mathematics. I chose this specific program because it had the world leader, what I would argue is the father of the, father of the field of mathematical biology. His name was Jim Murray. He had just moved a few years earlier from the Center for, Center for Mathematical Biology at Oxford. Um, and so he was the perfect person to introduce me and tutor, tutor me in the, in the field of the interface between mathematics and biology. At the same time, I was very interested in the interface between mathematics and the clinic and how physicians were interacting with patients and how I could create this opportunity for adding math to our understanding of cancer. So I began attending tumor board. So tumor boards are totally interesting, unique environment, right? So each, they're basically often a large table a group of physicians around this table, and they're all from different areas. So there's radiologists, there's physicists, uh, radiation biologists, <laughs> there's radiologists, there's uh, oncologists, there's uh, surgeons, uh, there's chemotherapists, you name it. They're all around the table, and they're all making the best decision possible. They're all collaborating to figure out what the best decision possible is for that individual patient. But what's also interesting, kind of like the bubble above the head of the physicians I was telling you earlier that I couldn't decode, what I learned was that the, the baseline decisions that were being made were a function of a simple answer, clinical trials. 
So each physician has in their back pocket some knowledge of the result of how, how a patient, um, how patients should do give, if I give them this therapy versus, versus the next therapy. And the format of those clinical trials are something like this. You group, uh, get a group of homogenous patients together, homogenous in the sense that we call them the same diagnosis, and I use air quotes liberally in, in this particular context. So they have the same diagnosis, they're extremely similar in some way, and we want to introduce a new therapy to them, and we want to compare that to some standard approach, what we call the standard of care. So these, physician, these patients are then given some therapy, and the net result is a survival curve. So at the end of the day, the key measure of this, of this outcome of this trial is this curve. So the curve has little steps on it, and each step is actually a patient dying. And so you get a, a sense of the degree to which this therapy is working summarized by one thing, this dot in the middle, the green dot. That's the median patient, that's the, that's the average result, that is the result that's in the pockets of the physicians at the clinical trial, at the room in the tumor ward. So they couldn't possibly carry this whole curve around them. The reality is you look at this and you say, okay, well, we're talking the median patient. That's where the terminology treating to the median comes from, treating to the mean. But now we all know, we all know in this room that everybody's different. My father was here. He died very early compared to when he should have by the median. My brother was here and my other brother was way out on the table, tail. He lived three years when he really shouldn't have. So we know there's a diversity. We know there's shades of gray. Everybody is different. They're all cut part of the rainbow. And the reality is how do you match those things together? How do you use information about individual patients and combine that with median understanding of a clinical trial? And so that's where our tools sort of interface. So my research began into a specific type of cancer known as glioma, specifically the most aggressive of those glioblastoma. Uh, I was working with this amazing neuropathologist, Buster Alvord. Um, he was a great mentor, mentor and friend in this area. So my research into this disease uh, began um, at this tumor board where I would learn all about what the clinical decisions were being made. But what's interesting and what's horrible about this disease is it's a horrible disease. <laughs> it's a very bad disease. Patients typically live 15 months. So the median survival for those patients is 15 months. And it's also considered uniformly fatal. The term is used in the first sentence of several, any article you would pull up on this topic. But we all know, and the physicians all know, that it's still just part of a rainbow, that each patient is part of a rainbow, this rainbow. So now let's fast forward to a tumor board for the specific case of, a, of primary brain tumors, gliomas, glioblastoma. So each of these patients are being discussed by the physician. They're trying to figure out what the best plan is for that particular patient, knowing in their back pocket what the green patient's gonna do, what that median patient should be expected to do. So the physicians are often trying to, to fight for that individual patient, right? They're often coming to the table going, hey, we know this patient is part of a rainbow, we just don't know where in the rainbow it is, uh, where in the rainbow this patient it will, will lie. And so there's lots of indicators for figuring that out. And so this is kind of where the science of biology meets the art of medicine, is figuring out where these, this interface might be. So one of the tools that physicians use in the case of t uh, brain tumors is MRIs. So here is an MRI, three-dimensional reconstruction of an MRI. We're gonna scroll from the bottom of the brain all the way up, and you'll see it outlined in red, the tumor. And you're gonna scroll back down and rebuild the three-dimensional region that is the tumor. Now this is exquisitely detailed, right? It's amazingly beautiful, right? It's all math and physics, ironically, underneath. But what's in interesting is physicians have to use these images to figure out how to tailor their therapy choice, given their knowledge of the clinical trial that tells me the median patient is expected to live 15 months, right? These images are used by surgeons to figure out how to approach the tumor. There are radiation therapists that figure out how to um, sculpt their dose for radiation therapy. They're also also uh, used by uh, physicians to understand response to therapy. And so that's the case I would like you to think about first. So in this case, you see the tumor, <laughs> there's a brain, there's a tumor, you can at least see the tumor, so this is good, okay. So the tumor, um, prior treatment, treatment is introduced, post-treatment there's another, there's a, a, a post-treatment response, another, another image. 
so the, what's interesting about this is that if you have um, a physician and you're sitting here going, well, look, prior to treatment, this tumor was the size, after treatment, it was another size. At the intervening time, there was some sort of treatment and the decision is, at the second time point, should we change therapy? The clinical trial says we should, this patient should have an improved survival of whatever amount by, because of the median patient outcome, but not necessarily for um, this particular patient. So what, do, we know, do we make the next, what's the next choice for this particular patient? So clinically, it is determined that this would be considered a failure. The tumor grew, it got bigger as a function of therapy, so it's a failure. But I'm gonna challenge you to reconsider that choice, reconsider the possibility that this may not be a failure. I'm gonna give you a little insight. This particular patient was a 66-year-old male who ended up living five years with a glioblastoma. So if that's a failure, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what is. So now let's go back to our, our MRI. And think about, the physicians are sitting there talking about these two images. The image, the tumor grew, grew through therapy, therefore we should change treatment. But also, we have this exquisite detail of this image, and we have an exquisite understanding of what's underlying this, underlying the, the image that we see. Specifically, in this case, we know if we were to zoom in, we could, if we had the tools for every patient, if we could zoom in, we would find individual cells migrating, individual cells proliferating within this tumor. You would see them um, growing and migrating and responding to potentially to the therapy that's being applied to them. So what's interesting is although we have this exquisite image that can't quite get down to the single cell detail, what you understand about the tumor is that it's a complex interacting system. This complex interacting system of agents, this complex system, is sort of at the basis of a, a lot of what we do scientifically in the world, right? The weather in the evening news is all about a complex system where data is integrated about the current wind speeds, right? Our understanding of financial markets, there are people all populating Wall Street that are all about quantifying and integrating complex information to understand the complex system that is the world market to make some sort of predictions. So at, that, so at a base, one could use math to understand this complexity. And even if you're talking really simply, talking about tumor cells proliferating, invading, and responding to therapy, you could write down a really simple equation. <laughs> <laughs> that said, the point is, is you look at the words. In this case, we're writing down that the cells are migrating, proliferating, and respond to therapy. And then you go back to those exquisite MRIs that the physicians were dealing with in tumor board. And you run this forward in time. Thankfully, you still see the red tumor here. So now let's look at the same exact case of that same exact patient. But let's imagine we had the opportunity and the insight to understand what that tumor was going to do without treatment. And here is the tumor evolving in time. You can see the untreated course has not changed. Untreated growth compared to the lesion above. Now I ask you, is this a response? Turns out. It is. So one of the problems in these clinical trials and one of the problems with new therapies that are studied is the fact that if the tumor grows through therapy, the physician changes course. Well, what's interesting is not all patients that grow through therapy end up doing poorly, just like this patient. This patient lived five years, okay? But it turns out in our studies of now hundreds of patients going on thousands, we looked at this sort of response, the degree to which the treatment deflects the tumor off its course is a response that tells you that that patient's gonna live longer, right? So this is a completely new tool to think about when you're a physician and you're struggling with the treatments in the intervening, there's the post-treatment tumor grew, okay, let's change course. Well, this treatment de derailed this tumor off course for quite, quite significantly, to the, so much so that this patient actually ended up living quite long and maybe they should have continued on this therapy because it was continuing to keep the tumor off course, keep the tumor derailed, right? So having this, uh, this, this in your back pocket is a completely new way to think about not the median patient, but, uh, but other, other patients, but individualizing our understanding of patients. So now imagine the case where you've got a tumor, you, you've, patient shows up at tumor board, we're all sitting around this table again, and now you have something equivalent of an iPad app. On that app, you have options for surgery, radiation, chemotherapy. That's because the surgeons have their, they have their plan. They have a whole navigational system where they figure out how they're gonna approach the tumor. 
Same thing for the radiation oncologist. They have a plan. They're going to input. They're they're going to they're going to have a plan. They're going to bring it to the table. And the chemotherapist, they have a plan. They're going to bring it to the table. Now, a lot of those plans are based on understanding of results of clinical trials, but what they don't know is really how those things marry together, how those things add together, right? So now let's imagine the surgical team brings in their their plan, and the radiation oncology team brings in their plan, and they're going to apply them in this way. So roughly on day 25, we're going to have the surgery of a, of a significant, of, of whatever, whatever degree, which I'll show you in just a moment. And then the radiation oncology plan in, in, involves sculpting the radiation dose so that it salvages a much, as much as possible of the normal, normal brain tissue, because you don't want to radiate the normal brain if you can at all avoid it. So now let's add those things together. So in this case, we're going to see, we see the tumor tumor being resected. There's a large resection from the surgery. There's the radiation therapy being introduced. You can see the tumor being derailed, sort of off course during that, and then the recurrence. So although this is not the ideal plan, ideal result, right? This is what would this patient would actually receive. This is in fact the standard of care for this particular patient. This is actually what this patient actually ended up receiving in real life. What you can say is, well, now you're sitting at tumor board and you can say, well, hey, I've got an opportunity here. This patient was significantly deflected off of their growth curve. Their tumor was de significantly deflected off their growth curve during radiation. Let's just extend that out a little bit or approach it in a slightly different way. Or what if we did that first and then did the surgery later? There's a lot of options that can be played out that are not practical currently because we focus so much on the clinical trials of a median patient. This is a way in which you can think about individualizing our understanding of a given patient's tumor, a given patient's response to treatment, and capitalizing on that for that patient. So if my father's physicians had had tools like this in their hands, perhaps my dad would not have received that last round of therapy that was so painful to his quality of life. Perhaps he would have received the next round of a different therapy that was actually more successful for him. And so that is the thing that, that certainly drives me. This is my father. These are the faces of the folks in my lab, the colleagues of friends and family of folks in my lab who have all faced cancer. And they are the people that remind us every day that every patient is unique and every patient truly de deserves their own equation. Thank you.